And adding some critique or adding some information or requesting specific answers to specific questions so in no particular order here we go we're going to start with answering the detractors Now, in my original first couple of videos, I talked about the Columbia River flood basalts. Now, these are huge lava flows uh, spread out over the Northwest United States. Now, uh, one of my favorite internet skeptics, L.A. Wilson, Lance Wilson, he actually lives in Washington area, so the Columbia River flood basalts really are right in his backyard. He's very into geology, so obviously he has something to say on the matter. Now, of course, Ellie Wilson is taking the argument that these lava flows were laid out over millions of years, the typical geological explanation. In particular, he objected to one thing I said. He said the Columbia flood basalts are not pillow basalts. I agree. And in fact, what I said in the video was there are pillow basalts strewn throughout the Columbia River flood basalts. I don't know how I can be any clearer. <laughs> I mean, that clearly tells you right off the bat, the pillow basalts are different than the Columbia River flood basalts because they're strewn throughout them. Now, we're going to go into more detail on that. Uh, so, no, I'm not saying the Columbia River flood basalts were pillows. I never said they were. I said it had pillow basalts. Now, Lance also argues from the paleosols. Now, for those of you not familiar with the technical term, a paleosol is a fossil soil. Basically, if you've got millions of years involved, you're going to have soil horizons that build up in the time gaps between each lava flow. They're going to be buried by a lava flow, and so you should have a fossil soil that we should find. Lance claims there's several paleosols and claims that they're evidence of deep time. We'll take a look at those. First of all, though, I would like to emphasize the point I was making in the video. I do not want anyone being distracted from the point I was making by a bunch of technical mumble jumble. I like getting into the technical stuff and I'm glad Lance brought this up. However, the point I was making was this, the present cannot be the key to the past. The Columbia River flood basalts, the lava flows, are called large igneous provinces. These are huge, provincially sized lava flows. There's actually several, several around the world. This is just one of the larger ones in the world the Columbia River flood basalts. You also have the Deccan traps in India and the Siberian traps in Russia. Now, in all three cases, you have these huge lava flows covering multiple states. These are huge lava flows. The present can't be the key to the past. We do not have provincially wide lava flows, 10,000 feet thick, building up on the continents today. And if we did, it would be a study in catastrophe, not long and slow geologic processes, not evidence, or not a study in millions of years. So, let's not forget that point. Let's take a look at the technical end of the arguments. Now, I mentioned the pillow basalts, and Lance is well aware of the significance of pillow basalts throughout the Columbia River basalts. Lance would argue, of course, this was the result of lakes and rivers throughout the lava flows as they were forming. I would beg to differ. I think the whole thing was laid down underwater during the, during the end of Noah's flood. So here's some of those pillow basalts. A couple of interesting things about pillow basalts. They are formed underwater. In fact, they are definitive for a lava flow being formed underwater. So if you see pillow basalts, you know that that lava was formed underwater. However, if the pillow basalts are absent, that does not mean it wasn't formed underwater. <laughs> now, this is where it gets technical. Okay, for example, 
okay? The lack of pillow basalts doesn't mean it wasn't formed in the air, okay? Uh, for example, in this case with the Columbia River flood basalts, this was a massive, fast lava flow. Everybody agrees on that. With fast, large flows, you've got a problem for pillow formation. It forms primarily at the leading edge, but it, it forms on the surface of the lava flow. If you have a massive lava flow that increases with volume, volume increases by the third power, surface area only increases by the second power. So the larger the lava flow, the less surface area you have per volume to form pillow basalts. If it's faster, then according to Cass and Wright, here's the reference for you right here, they have pointed out that there are lava flows being formed right now on the ocean floor that are not producing pillow basalts. What they are producing is what looks like pehoho toes. Now, these are supposed to be definitive for a lava flow formed in the air. So suddenly, what we thought was a lava flow that was formed in the air may have, in fact, be formed under water. And it may just be evidence of a fast flow. We already know the Columbia River flood basalts are fast, large flow. So it makes sense that we would see what we thought was pehoho toes is actually disguised Pillow basalts, really. Furthermore, welded tufts, again another type of lava formation supposedly supposed to form in air, have been formed, observed forming underwater. Check out the CRSQ article, there's the reference right there. Again, what we thought was evidence of lava flows in the air is actually from underwater. Now, this is where it gets real interesting. What you'll see around the Columbia River flood basalts, here's a couple of photos of you here. These are dramatic Columbia, uh, uh, columnar basalts. They're columns. You'll also see them at Yellowstone in the, the Snake River flood basalts, another massive lava flow in the northwest. So these dramatic columns are very nifty to look at, very interesting how they form. Now, originally, it was assumed that they take millions of years to cool, or at least thousands, a long time to cool, and it's this long, slow cooling process that forms the column. We now know that's not true. Bjornsson et al. published an article in Nature magazine quite a few years back, specifically in the lava formations from Hamai, Iceland. Now this is a very interesting story because what happened, they had a volcano that began to erupt large volumes of lava which were flowing towards the town and threatening the town. It was also threatening to flow into the harbor and block off the harbor. Now the harbor was the lifeline to the town. They could afford to lose a few houses, that's bad, but they can't lose the harbor. The whole town will be finished. So in an effort to stop this, they took seawater and pumped it onto the lava flows and cooled it, making a dam which redirected the lava. And it worked. They saved the town and the harbor because of that. Now later on, the areas where they covered it in, in seawater, they sectioned that, and lo and behold, what they found inside was what we call entablatures at the top, going down into columnar basalts, exactly what we see in the Columbia River flood basalts. So entablatures, here's some here, they look a lot like columnar basalts, except they're sort of bended and twisted and going in all directions. And that's actually from flowing water, primarily. But what we can, what we see, and what we thought was evidence that the Columbia River flood basalts were formed in air, is actually good evidence they were formed underwater. Here's what's happening. And the whole point of the Nature article was this. The water on the surface of the lava, it takes a thick lava flow to do this. The water cools the rock. Now, rock, of course, like any other material, when you heat it up, it expands. When you cool it, it shrinks. So now you have this huge lava field of rock that's now turned to rock. It's cooling, but as it cools, it wants to shrink. Now, rock is very weak in tensile strength, so when it tries to shrink, it can't, so it cracks. And it will make these columns, which can be have anywhere from four to eight sides. And so they look quite nifty, uh, but these columns, these cracks, first form. So clunk, they crack, and they make a column. The water can now go down into the cracks. This is where it gets interesting. The water goes into the cracks and starts removing heat from the rocks below which now cool, shrink, and crack in column with the columns above it. The water then goes into those cracks, cools the rock below that, it cracks, shrinks, 
etc., etc., and your columns are built vertically from top to bottom. So columns can be formed under water. In fact, the whole point of Bjornsson et al.'s article was trying to use this formation of the columns to help extract hydrothermal energy from hot rock and lava fields. That was the whole point of their article, was noting what's going on there and how to use it to our advantage. So, here's some shots of some tabulature, clearly made by water, loads of pillow basalts. This is all in the middle of the Columbia River flood basalts. There's a lot of them. Everything about this implies formation underwater. Now, when you take a look at these spectacular shots, again, remembering some of these lava flows are up to 10,000 feet thick. Now, in this particular photograph here, you'll see that there's multiple levels of the lava flows. Now, these were originally interpreted as different flows. Now, some hey, may be. However, many we can say are not different lava flows. And the reason is, if you take a close look at the picture, here's a closer look, take a look at it, you'll see that the columns actually join one level to the next. In other words, they all cooled together relatively quickly. There was no time gap between them. The columns started at the top, worked away to the bottom, and thus the lava flows at the bottom, which are now cooled, have to crack in unison with the ones above it. It's all evidence of rapid geologic time, not long and slow geologic time. They're joined columns. Now, in the interspersed amongst these lava flows, you've got some very interesting features. For example, this is a diatomaceous earth mine. What is diatomaceous earth? Diatomaceous earth is actually made up of microscopic skeletons of trillions and trillions of little marine organisms called diatoms. Well, wait a minute. What are skeletons of marine organisms buried by the trillions doing in the middle of lava flows that were supposed to have formed above ground water over millions of years? And you've got several mines like this. This is only one of several mines. So you've got marine organisms scattered throughout the Columbia River flood basalts. You also have sponge spicules and dinoflagellates. Again, marine organisms scattered throughout the flood, flood basalts. Now, you've all watched the video series, presumably, so you all know already what a water gap is. Well, interestingly, the Yakima River creates a water gap. It goes through a water gap which cuts right through the middle of the Columbia River flood basalts. That is evidence of a very powerful, very deep watery flow, I would dare say deep enough to cause a global flood. And in amongst those water gaps, you find, ta-da, quartzite boulders with percussion marks, rounded quartzite boulders. Again, just check out the video series. You'll see the significance of these things. It is clear evidence of a powerful watery catastrophe. I would suggest to you it is the receding flood waters of Noah's flood that caused those. So what about these paleosols? Well, paleosols like this one? Well, turns out this wasn't paleosols. In fact, I took several samples. I took them over to a geologist friend of mine. He's an acting geologist with the USGS. And he identified them quite simply as baked clay, basically. So what it is, this is from volcanic ash, which, as, which is hot from a volcano, comes down and as it hits water, it fractures and becomes basically a baked clay. So these supposed layers of paleosols, in this case, were just baked clay. Now, Mike Ord and a couple of other geologists I know, Dennis Buckavoy and John Wimborapi, all went and studied the Columbia River flood basalts as well. Now, one of their layman's articles, uh, here's the reference right here. Uh, it's available online on the Answers in Genesis website. I encourage you to read it. They went and studied a few paleosols as well. The first thing you'll notice is the same thing that I noted. First of all, you got to remember, my friends and I, we drove roughly probably about 1,400 miles of roads throughout the Columbia River flood basalts just studying the Columbia River flood basalts. We found two places in all of that driving of supposed, of th what could be argued to be a paleosol. Only two. Mike Ord and his friends had to specifically get guided to one of the locations which had a supposed fossil soil, a supposed paleosol. They had to ask. 
and they only found it because they were directed to it. The paleosols, if that's what they are, first of all, are very few and far between. If these layers have been going, being laid down for millions of years, we should have a lot of fossil soils. For example, today in modern times, even in deserts and dry environments, we can observe fossil soils forming, mature fossil soils, we can observe them forming in decades. Do the math. <laughs> Do the math. We should have hundreds to thousands of fossil soils interspersed amongst the layers of the Columbia River flood basalts, if there were even hundreds of years in between each lava flow. I mean, think about it. Today, the island of Circe off the coast of Iceland, it was a, a lava island that just suddenly appeared in the 70s. And today, it has soils on it, mature soils. It has beaches. Animals live there now, okay? This island sprung up from a volcanic eruption in the 70s. So in decades, we are seeing fossil soils form rapidly. Where's all the fossil soils in the Columbia River flood basalts? They're gone. Why? May I suggest to you, it's not the fossil soils that's missing. It's the deep time that is assumed and has no evidence for it. Now, also amongst the Columbia River flood basalts, check this photo out. This is pelagonite intermixed with pillow basalts, which are laid down in a cross-bedded fashion sandwiched in between the Columbia River flood basalts. As we all know from the video series, as I showed you by our experiments done in the lab, cross beds are formed by water. I don't think anyone will deny that these cross beds were made by water, a large amount of water. In fact, these uh, cross beds are tens of feet high. I think I estimated they were about 50 feet high. They're pretty big cross beds, okay? They're not small things. Again, more evidence it was formed underwater. Last but not least, the Columbia River flood basalts are tholeitic. In the words of Wikipedia, tholeitic basalts are the most common volcanic rocks on Earth as they are produced by submarine volcanism at mid-ocean ridges and make much of the ocean crust. In other words, chemically, the Columbia River flood basalts are identical to flood basalts being formed on the floor of the oceans today. All of the evidence, when taken as a whole, for the Columbia River flood basalts screams that it was laid down under massive amounts of water. Now, it's true, some parts of it probably came up in the air towards the top. Uh, you have trees, for instance, which are captured in the lava flows, but they're near the top. The uh, rhinoceros as well, the blue lake rhinoceros, was also not far from the top. So, way, the way I see it, the continent was sliding to the west during the hydroplate event. The water began to dry up underneath the continent. It started grinding to a halt. Friction melted massive amounts of lava, also caused cracks. The lava spewed up, went what was downhill towards the west. However, as it's sliding to the west and all these lava flows are flowing to the west, now it also runs into the Pacific rise. Mountain chains start forming from west to east on the west coast of the United States, and now what was downhill is now uphill. It all makes sense within the concept of a global flood. Oh, hold on a minute, Ian. What you said about the polystrate trees isn't true. Some of those trees have roots and they were buried in situ. That's proof of it. Okay, now this argument stems, of course, from the upright fossil buried trees. Now, we must first differentiate between the trees and the lycopods. Again, uh, this specifically, this discussion specifically referred to Specimen Ridge in Yellowstone Park, which of course are polystrate trees. What you see at Yellowstone, uh, the Alaskan coal mines, as well as Axel Heiberg Island, those are all fossil trees, not giant hollow reeds like you see at Joggins, Tennessee, and much of the Pen Pennsylvanian coal mines. So what the argument is, is that there are stumps there with roots still attached. Hey, I agree. I've seen them. However, you'll also notice that the roots are never intact. In other words, yeah, the roots might go three, four, five, six feet, but they're broken off at the end. Why? Because they were ripped up in a flood. Secondly, if you recall, I showed you this picture in the Complete Creation video series. This is a lycopod, which was upside down. Now, it had intact roots, and it had intact rootlets. Now, before we examine that just a little closer, take a look at this picture here. This is a photograph of the Stigmarian roots 
from the lycopod plants at Joggins. You'll notice the pock marks all around the root, and you'll notice in the portion of the rock I'm holding with my other hand, where you can see the rootlets, which radiate in all directions out from the roots. So these roots have rootlets attached. Now take a look at the roots of this polystrate plant from Joggins, and notice anything missing? Yeah, the rootlets, they're gone. So even if it has intact roots, that still does not mean it grew in place. The rootlets can be stripped off. Secondly, this upside down stump at Joggins had intact roots and intact rootlets, but the stump was upside down. Those roots were on the same horizon as other stumps which were upright. Now, of course, evolutionists will argue that because these trees were all on the same horizon, this was a fossil forest, the, the floor of a forest. Well, that argument doesn't stack up either because the upside down stump has its roots on the same horizon as other stumps with intact roots. So obviously, this is all good evidence of a watery catastrophe not long in slow geologic processes. These were not trees that grew in place. Secondly, or lastly I should say, thank you to the atheists and the skeptics who have agreed with us that it is possible to catastrophically bury a tree upright. We appreciate your agreement. Okay, one of my fellow creationists on YouTube, Andrew Kinghorn15, sent this in to me. Uh, I get quest comments and questions like this quite regularly, so I'm glad he sent this in. One skeptic wrote into one of his videos and said this. The comments were regarding Noah's Ark. Nope, Ark made that big out of 4,000-year-old technology and containing uncountable numbers of animals and food, whilst having to cope with giant ocean that covers the Earth, which would mean waves hundreds of meters high that you argue forms mountains. Not very credible. It's a laughable story. Okay, I get comments like this all the time from various skeptics who apparently don't understand the whole story of Noah's Ark, nor what it really means. So let's slowly dissect exactly what this one skeptic said. I, I don't know who this was. Uh, the comment was sent to me, but I get comments like this all the time. So, part one. Nope. Ark that made, Ark that big made out of 4,000 year old technology. Notice, first of all, the subtle evolutionary assumptions here. He is assuming that people in the past were stupider than they are now. Wait a minute. How do you know that people in the past weren't smarter than we are today? Now, I dealt with this in Chapter 9, or Part 9 of the Complete Creation series. Uh, however, there was also more to that story. Now, first of all, I also mentioned in the video series, there has been fossil trees found in Australia, which were 150 feet to the first branch. They estimated those trees were up to 450 feet tall. So trees, of course, bear in mind, were bigger in the past. But my good friend, Dr. Don Shockey, who has been on Mount Ararat a number of times, following up possible reports of what appears to be Noah's Ark still on Mount Ararat today, uh, as he was following, the, following those up and carrying on his research, had a discussion with a Jewish rabbi who explained to him what gopher wood was. Gopher wasn't a type of wood, it was a process. He actually demonstrated by taking a tree, a specific tree, broke it, took the sap from it, and glued two sticks of wood together, cross grain. He said, this is gopher wood. So basically what he's saying is Noah's Ark was built out of plywood. For all intents and purposes, basically plywood that was probably several feet thick, and I built a huge vessel out of it, incredibly strong. And by the way, very simple and effective technology. Let's take a look at what else he said which would mean waves hundreds of meters high that you argue forms mountains. Not very credible, it's a laughable story. Okay, I, I don't know what Andrew may have said, but I know that I've never said anything like this. I don't know of any creationist who has said that the mountains we find around the world were formed by water. I don't know why he's saying this. Anyway, and containing uncountable numbers of animals and food. Actually, it's very countable. May I please recommend to you a book called Noah's Ark, A Feasibility Study by John Wooden Morapi. John is an excellent researcher, one of the most tenacious ones I've ever encountered. Let's take a look at what God told Noah. This is coming back to the scriptures. One, take limited numbers of land animals and flying creatures, plus the eight individuals of Noah's family. Amphibians, insects, and marine animals were not taken on the ark. Also bear in mind diversity of the species. A small group of animals can lead to a large group of diversity. 
And this is microevolution. This is not macroevolution. For example, modern canines, dogs, coyotes, wolves, other canines probably descended from one type of canine. So basically, Noah took one type of canine onto the ark. We now have a wide diversity right from the completely useless chihuahua right up through to the wolf, the timber wolf. Now, based on the Bible, John Wood Morapi estimates that there was probably about 16,000 animals on the ark. Now, that's a lot of animals. However, let's consider the average size of those animals, from the elephant right down to the mouse. The average size of the animals is about that of a sheep. Now, Noah most likely took babies on the ark. Nevertheless, let's go with adult sizes with an average size of a sheep. Now, the ark, we have its dimensions in the Bible, so we know its rough capacity. And we can compare it, for instance, to modern railroad stock cars. This would mean that uh, the ark would have the equivalent capacity of roughly 569 modern railroad stock cars, which today, a double-decker stock car, holds about 240 sheep. Now, let's set aside the majority of that boxcar for food and water, limit the capacity at 50 sheep per car. That is still 28,000 450 animals that we can fit on the ark with enough food and water for a year. Now, let's set aside even more space in there for food and water. Let's limit the size to 30 sheep per car. And we still have room to spare. Noah can easily take all these animals on the ark. Now, some evolutionists, and even a couple of creationists, have tried to poo-poo the idea that Noah's Ark is on Mount Ararat. This is sort of a side issue, but I'll, I'll deal with it very briefly. They claim that Ararat is a stratovolcano, therefore Noah's Ark can't be on there. Uh, no. Flow into the canyon, the Ewan Carrick lava flows. They got ages of anywhere from 10,000 to uh, 2.6 billion years old. Now here's the catch. You can go and visit this website right here and check for yourself. They have photographs of Indian artifacts in the lava flows. The Indians, as part of their religious rituals, would attempt to capture some of this lava, some of this liquid lava, as it flowed into the canyon. We know those Indians lived there 800 to 1,000 years old ago. Therefore, we know that the Ewan Carrot lava flows are 800 to 1,000 years old. The youngest Absolute age provided by radiometric dating on that lava flow was 10,000 years old. The oldest was 2.6 billion years old. Tell me, how do we know which age is correct? You see, whenever we can test the radiometric dating method, it fails miserably. Radiometric dates are based on circularity and evolutionary assumptions.